Uh, greetings, everyone. My name is Stan Shelton. I'm a vice president at HKS in the Health Practice. And thank you for joining us in our uh, virtual summit regarding uh, what would happen if we used a hotel for a patient care uh, setting. Uh, I'll ask your forgiveness up front. Please bear with us as we uh, learn the process of this virtual summit on the fly. So far, we've got about 212, 213 people joining us from uh, all parts of the all parts of the community. What I want to do here is just review with you what the process is going to be that we're going to follow today. We're going to have a brief introduction, and I'll review the format. And Jason Schroer will talk about the uh, the purpose of this summit we'll go into a very brief review of a concept study that HKS performed, and then really we'll open the rest of the time up to, uh, to panel, uh, panel discussion. Uh, I'll be the host of the session, and it'll be my job really just to keep things moving. We've got a virtual panel form today that's got about 40 or so people in it that are representatives from the United States Army Corps of Engineers, emergency management offices, at least in uh, Dallas County, and we may have others represented, uh, many representatives from the hospitality industry and healthcare and the design and construction industry. We may also have uh, some folks from uh, the media that are joining in on this call too. So panelists, and those are, panelists are the ones that have uh, the ability to speak and whose image we see on the video. Uh, when we get to the to the questions and answers in the comments section, uh, I'll pitch a question to you. If if you elect to answer the question, please identify yourself and the organization that you represent. And when you're not speaking, just so we can keep this going, uh, so everyone can understand, please mute your microphones. Uh, media representatives, if you have some questions at the back end of this, uh, the last page has contact information for Julie Abiala, who is uh, leading our, uh, our public relations efforts on this. And so please, uh, please direct your questions to her. Guests, uh, at, you, you don't have privileges uh, on uh, microphones and the uh, video cameras, but you do have the ability using the Zoom, Zoom chat function to ask questions or make comments. And uh, you'll see on every slide, there's a, there's a reminder, please submit a question or a comment at any time during the chat. I'll be noting those, and when we get to the question and answer section, we'll work off of that list as well. So um, that's our process. With that, I will hand it off to Jason Schroer who will uh, get us going. Thanks, Dan. Hey, yeah, my name is Jason Schroer, and uh, I'm an architect who uh, serves as the leader of our health practice here at HKS. We're a global firm. Uh, our core business is architecture and design, and we've been focused on that for uh, over 80 years with experts in many building types, and in particular, uh, health and hospitality, um, which is kind of the, the, how we got started into this discussion is we knew we could find creative ways to perhaps help our communities. Uh, why we're here, um, we're a learning organization. You know, it's our value to share um, for the greater good and for the communities in our industry. Today, we act as connectors, you know, to the knowledge and perspective that's beyond our own, to be honest. And metaphorically, we feel like it's an opportunity to connect us, you know, in a time of uh, separation. So as we set the groundwork for the conversation, uh, it starts with the predicted bed shortage uh, for hospitals globally. Uh, we began to ask the question, you know, what building type could be quickly convertible, uh, which led us to the conversation with our hospitality uh, experts uh, on hotels. And then we came to the, you know, the context of, uh, is it something that can be implemented quickly? And is it better than a tent? And we know that it can't really meet the guidelines of a hospital, but can we get close to that in terms of patient care? Next slide, Stan. This is just kind of a, one of the predictors, the models, you know, we've all seen, 
that shows, uh, I think Stan, you got your, you probably got stuck on your butt and you're good. That just shows, you know, one of the predictors of the total bed sh shortage uh, for the U.S. You know, obviously this is a global pandemic and many communities across the globe will have spikes and have issues with capacity. So, um, thank you, Jason. So, my name is Sergio Sainz. I uh, direct our hospitality uh, group and I want to talk uh, briefly, you know, as, as this idea of the model that Jason's describing. Uh, we're going to, we, our thought, our intent has been, how do we turn a hotel into a place where we can help service uh, the communities? Not, not quite a hospital. And the focus of this uh, concept study is specifically on a full service convention center hotel. They're a close proximity to the urban centers uh, in our country and uh, their ability to have uh, similar amenities as that of a hospital and ability to service uh, patients in this case, as opposed to guests, is, is, was of particular interest to this team. Uh, just to name a few, to try to draw some parallel. So obviously the guest room uh, parallel to the patient uh, room, uh, the lobby and check-in area of a hotel to a triage and intake registration space, uh, the conference room and large meeting facilities to potentially support spaces, uh, medication supply, equipment, and perhaps even as we'll see uh, further into the presentation, uh, an opportunity uh, beyond that. Uh, the ability to have uh, the kitchen, uh, full kitchen and room service of, a, of this type of hotel, which is the same that a hospital would need. Uh, restaurants, uh, probably more focused in this case for staff dining and, and uh, uh, other, if, other beyond patients. Uh, dock for in and out uh, waste, and this talks about the ballroom as a tier two patient care or ward setup. And we'll touch base a little bit more of that on that, and then the outdoor space, uh, hopefully for some um, ambulation and fresh air uh, for patients. Hi, I'm Jenny Evans. I work with HKS as the development director uh, for community. Even for this role, I've been acting as a clinical operations specialist. I'm a nurse by training, and just to let you know, as we dove into this study. We really wanted to go to what we think is this, you know, one of the major sources of truth, and that's the CDC. And uh, the CDC's looked at different patient types in terms of tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier one being COVID-19 positive patients who maybe don't need uh, uh, medical attention, but they can't stay at home. Uh, maybe they can't be sequestered at home, or maybe they're just a little bit insomniac. Uh, asymptomatic, so asymptomatic, so um, maybe they just need an isolation site. And um, we thought these these patients might be applicable for a hotel. Tier two as well, which is more of a lower acuity, they might require some minor intervention, some monitoring, possibly if they're having shortness of breath, um, you know, we can monitor their oxygen saturation, but very low acuity, minor, minor intervention from a healthcare team. And then tier three is the higher acuity, um, which um, a hotel could, you know, there are other sites or a hotel could possibly, but for our study, we looked at tier three patients, the higher acuity patients being admitted to the hospital. So really we came up with five patient types um, that we think were applicable for the COVID-19 hotel stay um, for basis of our study. They're all ambulatory. They could be suspected of being a carrier. They might be positive, but not having symptoms, or they live within a high-risk population, live alone, can't care for themselves. They need some um, assistance with their activities of daily living, um, or they might be getting discharged from the hospital and still require um, sequestration, but um, can't go home yet. And certainly no pediatrics. Pediatrics has specialized equipment and supplies, and it really wouldn't be safe to put them in this type of facility that's primarily for adults. So what that looks like um, in terms of a configuration is that a hotel, what's you know, advantageous is that there's, there is a drive up area. So patients um, ideally get tested in their car. Um, and uh, the tests now are less than 30 minutes, so it's pretty, it's pretty awesome, and then they would be sent into a triage 
test area, if necessary, it was deemed that they need a little bit more social assessment or physiologic assessment, and that could be done in the hotel lobby. And then depending on their symptoms and condition, they could either go home or they would be transferred immediately to the hospital if they were approaching that tier three um, level of acuity. If they were in that tier one, tier two level of acuity, then they could be put in, tier one level, definitely put into a guest room. Um, so maybe just some minor observation. And the benefit of the guest room is that the door can be closed, they have a private bathroom, and they can remain there for the duration of their symptoms, or as they improve, they could go home, or when they're tested negative, um, they would go home as well. But if they do start to have a little bit more, um, uh, more symptoms or their condition worsens, then they would be able to go into a higher step up area, which we're calling the ballroom, but a large open space where you could set up uh, sort of a ward type setting for better observation and um, monitoring. And this area, um, what's, what's advantageous about this in terms of a hotel is that it does provide options. So there is flexibility within the hotel for a low acuity moving into a little bit more of a moderate acuity. And then from there in that moderate acuity area, they would either um, go back down to a guest room or they could go home or they might have to be transferred to the hospital. Thanks, Jenny. So as we kind of just jump into the tectonics of what that could look like, you can kind of see the cross section of what would be a podium and a tower a configuration for one of these types of hotels with the, the uh, patient wards, those open areas could be uh, the ballroom areas and then of course the guest and patient rooms. And the other advantage that we have too is you can sequester staff to the extent needed also in uh, guest rooms. And other, other uh, things that have, been, that have come up in terms of what could hotels be used for, we've been asked a lot of questions about whether they could be used just for caregivers uh, or if they could be used for non-infectious patients that they need to get out of the hospital. And we think that there's just enough flexibility to accommodate um, any of those types of scenarios. As we kind of just jump in a little more granular, uh, you know, the, the guest floor is not that much different than a patient floor would in a hospital. We would have to uh, commandeer a few of the guest room spaces for some nursing support, uh, also supplies and um, goods, and also trash and soiled. The other thing that we would recommend to the extent that you can is to uh, identify the elevators for patient traffic separate from the elevators from staff and equipment traffic. And these types of hotels offer the ability to do the on stage, off stage. In the guest room and conversion, it's not that complicated. Um, in the case where you may have the time, we would recommend to remove the carpet. The exposed concrete would probably be just fine in this case for a temporary solution. In the, in the case where you may not have time to remove the carpet, there are some coverings that uh, have been investigated that could work and could be actually removed uh, between patient cases if you need to do that. Um, at the end game though, um, it is probably recommended that most of the carpet and other type materials will be removed uh, as part of a renovation before you get back to normal operations as a hotel. But you can kind of see those configurations are congruent. And then on the first floor, there's a lot going on in this diagram, but as Jenny spoke about, the ability to have drive-through testing, the ability to bring uh, uh, potential COVID candidates in for interview and triage, and then, you know, you probably would look at needing to do some temporary partitions in order to separate some traffic. But generally, we want to do everything we can to keep an onstage, offstage approach to where staff uh, can, to the extent necessary, be uh, separate from the patient traffic. And then award configuration that we talked about, you know, this gives you the most flexible space. We see this configuration already in many of the convention center uh, interventions uh, across the nation. It's not much different. Um, we feel like in this case, if you do use guest rooms for patient care, that uh, this could be kind of that step up type uh, area where you can have the higher trained staff cohorted with any equipment that might be necessary cohorted. Again, um, you know, our suggestion right now is still the tier one, tier two patients. Um, but if you recall back to Jenny's diagram, in the case that the hospital is full and there is no space for transport from this 
site to that to a hospital site there may need to be uh, some conditions in which you can keep some patients that may need a higher level of observation and even some breathing intervention on site. Stan, you're on mute. Uh, yeah, what we've got here is a conversion timeline that really shows the shows it taking between 10 and 14 days to convert that uh, full service convention hotel into a patient care site. And frankly, most of the time that's associated with that uh, time frame is in procurement time as opposed to doing the work. The plan that we've done and what uh, certainly some of the course plans have been do really a, a very limited amount of renovations within uh, within the hotel. So uh, you can see how these how these range. The first and perhaps most difficult step is to identify who the partners are going to be on this arrangement. Uh, once that's done, the team needs to form. The leader needs to be designated. This is absolutely something that needs a leader as opposed to a, a group of leaders. Uh, and then once that's determined, um, the first thing that has to happen is the care plan needs to be developed. And that's where uh, the decisions are made about is a level one patient, a level two patient, et cetera. I'm not going to go through each one of these lines. All of this is going to be available in some materials that uh, you'll have access to after this session. But really the core things that have to happen are the evaluation of the systems in the hotel in comparison to the types of patients that are going to be cared for. Uh, and we'll get some feedback from um, hotel operators in the core a little bit later, but one of the most challenging systems to, uh, to look at are the mechanical systems, the air, negative, we've all heard a lot about negative pressure, uh, and how much can those be modified in a short period of time to accommodate these kind of patients. We've also uh, looked at the, uh, some operational considerations for this conversion that really have more to do with uh, the healthcare organization that is going to be staffing this than the hotel operators or the Corps of Engineers or any of the other implementation team. But all of these issues that are shown here have to be considered. And number one, top of the list is staffing. We've all heard about the shortage of beds, if we were somehow able to magically get the appropriate number of beds and uh, rest, uh, ventilators and isolation rooms, then we would still have a significant um, staffing shortage. That is, by the way, one of the uh, advantages of the ward care in the, in the ballroom or the large space uh, kind of setting is it does allow for more efficient uh, higher uh, uh, clinician to, to uh, patient staffing ratios. Uh, this is some information that we pulled from the advisory board that really begins to talk about uh, what organizations can do, especially healthcare organizations can do to increase the availability of staffing. For most healthcare organizations, these are not new ideas. Uh, now, one of the things that we're seeing uh, as a result of this and what's going on in the economy. We've uh, heard some stories from England that flight attendants are being trained not to provide the clinical care, but to provide support uh, for patients that don't require a credentialed or a licensed caregiver. Uh, in this same context, there's an opportunity for hotel staff to have some care role in these in these types of settings if we can do the training uh, quickly enough and if the staff is available and willing so what we want to do now is really move into uh, questions and discussions and i'm going to leave this slide up for a little bit it won't be up for long uh, but it's got jason's contact information sergio's contact information and Julie's contact information. Again, you'll all get some materials later as we captured your email addresses. Uh, but if in the meantime you have a question, a follow-up, et cetera, 
uh, you can contact really any one of the three people uh, that are listed here. And then once we get into the questions, uh, what you'll see instead of this slide are the, the, the faces of those that are responding to the questions. So let me get that started with uh, a question that I'm gonna pitch to George Lee with the Corps of Engineers, and that is George. Uh, and, and you may wanna hand this off to some of our emergency preparedness folks, but how do hotel owners and operators connect with opportunities for the potential adaptation uh, of a hotel to an alternative care facility? Yeah, and this is George Lee with the Army Corps of Engineers. Sounds yes, sir. Great. First, I want, I want to start, I'll, I'll answer the question uh, because it's, I want to start by introducing our team and then uh, we can talk about because uh, talk, we'll talk about the question response in, in the context of what's actually happening on the ground right now. And I'll take a little bit of time to run down. I appreciate uh, the introduction because you're spot on on a lot of, a lot of the issues and I'll, I'll talk about that. Uh, first of all, I'm George Lee, I'm Chief of the Military Engineering Branch at uh, Headquarters USA's. We have Mr. Scott Wick on the line with us, he's our Chief Architect. Uh, Mr. Kenny Simmons, a Senior Construction Manager at the Headquarters USA's. Mr. Hank Thompson, he's Chief of our Architect Engineering Contracts and Criteria Branch at the Huntsville Engineering Center. And the Huntsville Engineering Center is the group that's developed the performance stacks of COVID, non-COVID care, arena, and hotel that's currently uh, published on the internet. Uh, real estate, we have uh, Mr. Ted Nettles, a real estate specialist, headquarters USA, and I'm not sure if Marsha DeVille's on the line, but also real estate uh, specialist at the headquarters USA. So that's our team. We're going to uh, answer the questions the best we can. I want to start by saying that, uh, as uh, I think Jason said, that uh, this organization is a learning organization and a connector. And uh, I think that's exactly what we're doing. We're learning as we go, and we're making connections. And the connections that uh, we're making are between the uh, federal, state, uh, local authorities working under the direction of FEMA because when the president declares a national exam disaster, whether it be a hurricane or this situation, uh, we work through FEMA. FEMA gives us our uh, mission assignments and we go out and execute. So FEMA, FEMA is our primary federal partner along with Health and Human Services. But we're working with the state governments. Uh, each one of our division commanders and district engineers is in contact with the local, uh, the state governor and local officials. I wanted to say that, uh, like, like you were saying, I think uh, Stan or someone said the first is an assessment as you go out and look at these sites. Uh, the Corps has done uh, about almost 800 assessments, actually more than 820. We have another 60 on the table and we'll probably get some more today of assessments where we've been asked by local officials go out and do look at these facilities. And of that, we've completed, uh, we've completed 800, but half of those were hotels and half were arenas. And that's important because if we look at what's materializing out there, of the, the, uh, the arenas in the uh, hotel assessments, we have 17 contract awards units. We're, we're there developing, actually converting at this time, 17 facilities. So there's not a lot out there. There's a lot, lot in the pending category uh, that we're working, but they have two hotels that are uh, likely to become awards uh, tonight, today, tonight in St. Louis, the Hilton and Quality Inn. I think almost 400 beds between the two. Other than that, we have one one pending hotel out in California, but the hotels haven't been grabbing and biting. The state and local officials have gone to arenas, convention centers, and their own state facilities. Uh, we have uh, about 27 mission assignments and. Uh, $1.6 billion uh, from uh, FEMA at this point. We have over 15,000 Board of Engineers uh, personnel engaged in, in the, uh, the development right now. And I think as you, you said before, the, uh, the first step is the assessment and you got it right on as far as what we're looking for, the number, what number of beds, looking at the mechanical, and more important, what type of patient care. And that it's important that the Board of Engineers is not making those decisions. Those decisions are made local with the health, health uh, uh, professionals from the state, local government, health and human services, based on the, uh, the needs of the local hospital, the uh, demand, uh, and tight, anticipated tight care for overflow. But the, uh, that's the first step is the assessment. Hey, George, um, let me bump in here for a second. Um, 
Is, is the reason, is the primary reason that the arenas are getting chosen over the hotels is because they're already owned by some governmental entity and it's just viewed to be an easier or cheaper transaction? That, that was a sound bite that I heard initially and a lot is because of, it, it does save time in the process as far as negotiation. The, the governor, the state owns the facility, they go right in. And for example, in the Java Center in New York, uh, we had days to, your timelines of like 10 days, 14 days, we had days to complete the facility. Uh, often we don't have the luxury of time and we're, our timeline's about five days to 14. So uh, opportunities, quick, quick wins, and more importantly, looking at what type patient goes in what type of facility. Because the Java Center was started with non-COVID, just recently switched to COVID care. Now let me ask you this, uh, kind of along the same lines, or is it the core that is primarily doing the negotiations with the, the owner, whether that's a governmental entity or not, doesn't really matter. Is the core doing the negotiation with the facility owner, or is that generally the state or the local emergency management office? I, predominantly, it's, it's been the state local government. I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump in and let uh, Ted uh, see if, uh, on the real estate end what he's seen out there and, and the moving forward. So Ted, can you help us out on that? And Thanks, Georgia. You are correct. I mean, the state's responsible and the state's still in the negotiation with the property owners on these. Over. Okay. So Stan, to, to your question initially was how, where are the opportunities? The opportunities are, are with the state and local governments, the ho local hospital uh, care system, understanding what their needs are. Uh, and understanding as a service provider, do you have that facility to provide that opportunity? We're, we're in response, we're acting in response to the, the need that's given to us by the state and local governments. Over. Hey, George, I would add, um, there's a couple instances where, you know, those contracts do come from the core. Right now we're seeing a lot of the states leaning forward. Um, to, to execute the mission, you know, at the lowest level possible. Um, I can type in a, a web link just into the chat so that you can see um, if there's any questions um, regarding specific uh, opportunities that might come up with the core. Uh, there's an email address there, and I promise you that there are human beings looking at that email inbox um, to, to gather some, some market research. Over. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if this is to, I don't know if this is to, to Kenny or George or really anybody else, but once a facility is converted, who is responsible for providing the clinical staff for that facility? Again, whether it's a hotel or a, a arena or convention center, it doesn't really matter. So for the Corps of Engineers, you'll, you'll hear a chief uh, from time to time talk about three S's, uh, staff supplying services. They're not the Corps of Engineers will provide the facility and the health and human services, the, the local health officials, the state officials will provide the staff. Okay. So we've got representatives from the uh, Dallas County Emergency Management uh, offices on the line. Do you have anything to add to, uh, to what George and Kenny have talked about or anything else that we ought to understand regarding how these relationships are made? You might need to unmute yourself if you're. All right, well, well, we'll come back to that. So George, how many facilities have, have you finished converting? That's a great question. I, I don't have that, that number. Do anybody on the team have the actual conversion number actually finished at this point? I know the finished and complete. And I know others are coming online daily. So what, what we're doing is we're operating ahead of a peak. Uh, and the peak is done by the modeling. And uh, some of them are, are scheduled as, as early as uh, 10, 12 April and others after the 2024. But uh, anything young, we don't normally get more than two. Uh, two weeks uh, of opportunity to build out. So I, I don't have the exact number of which ones actually have been complete and operating. George? 
This is yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I'm looking at the chief stocking points this morning. New SACE has awarded 17 contracts and developing 17 alternate care facilities across nine states. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I just don't know how I'm gonna I'm gonna look at my notes here to see because I there are, there are a handful that are out there that have been completely turned over. Uh, and I'll find out through the course of the call, maybe I can get you an answer. All right, so this may be a technical question, but we've got hey, I think Stan. Another, yes, sir. Yes, sir, Kenny. Hey, so um, I just pulled up our tracker and everybody's where you know New York is kind of where we started. Um, one of the phases at the Javits Center is almost complete. It's like 90%, uh, about 2,600 beds. Um, and then uh, there's a facility in Detroit that's almost there, uh, but they're both the arena style. Uh, mm -hmm. Those are the first slug of awards we had. Right. Now, uh, and I've got a question here from uh, David Contreras. Uh, and he's asking about the HVAC systems in these sort of venue spaces and what sort of con uh, uh, changes are you making to that HVAC system in order to care for two or three or a thousand, two or three hundred or a thousand patients in that large open space? Yeah, this is George. Hank, you want to take that on and I'll, I'll follow up. With Maybe. Sure, Hank, Hank Thompson here from the Huntsville Center. Uh, the medical facility center of expertise focused on uh, focused on a uh, a couple of cases in the arena or a large con convention center, um, and their uh, performance work statements uh, didn't specify um, how to solve the problem, but it gave some guidelines on the best way to do it, and it really was focused on two two areas: one where each patient was isolated in negative pressure and one where an entire uh, arena was open and it wasn't for acute care. Um, so not specific to each, each location, but a way to uh, manage uh, isolation down to, to each room um, with, with guidelines for how to set up that HVAC system. Right. Yeah, so David, uh, David Contreras has a follow-up question and it's really how did the mechanical systems for a hotel differ from say an intensive care unit. Um, Jason or Jenny, I don't know if you want to take a stab at this or if you want me to address it. Uh, I'll just say that in an intensive care room, the, the most important difference between that and a hotel room or an open setting is the intensive care room has negative pressure. So that means that all the stuff that's floating around in the room stays in the room and does not get pushed out through the door into the corridor. Uh, and that's how we isolate patients from folks that don't have uh, that illness. Uh, and that's how we keep the contagion in the room. In the hotel, I think it's safe to say that none of the rooms or areas are, have negative pressure. The hotel room itself, a guest room, is positive to the corridor. That means that the air that happens that is circulating in the room gets pushed out into the corridor. And in these large spaces, uh, of course, it's uh, it's a positive pressure circumstance. Now, Hank, what we have uh, learned from talking to folks is that also those large spaces, while they are positively pressured, they also have the ability to bring in fairly significant amounts of outside air. Are, are, are y'all making adjustments to the outside air in those facilities when you open them up for that sort of large ward care? This is Hank, I, I can't speak to that. I'm not uh, deep enough into how they're, we're okay. Hey Stan, this is John Hogan from Marriott. Um, I, I posed that question to Terry Smith in a hotel room. Could we make the rooms uh, negative pressure? Do you want Terry to answer that, or you want uh, some of us to address that? Or, uh... I, I was I was directing it towards Terry, but he needs to. Unmute. Yeah, this this. Sorry, this is Terry. I had to unmute myself. My uh, space bar wasn't working for that, but. Um, so a couple points is, first of all, uh, the gentleman just said there's massive amounts of ventilation air potentially available in a large space like a ballroom. 
I can go to 100% outside air. We've got exhaust systems in there, so we can displace a tremendous amount of air. Um, the problem you have when you try to get into individual hotel rooms, and I'll give you a, a, a specific example, is the normal amount of outside air that we would put into a guest room is 35 CFM, and we would exhaust 30 CFM from the bathroom. So that guest room is about 5 CFM positive pressure. Not a big deal, but in this instance, obviously it is. I've gone through all the core of engineer requirements, and in order for a hotel guest room to be turned into an acute care room, I need to increase the exhaust from the bathroom from 30 CFM to 200 CFM, which is substantial. Then not only do I have the 200 CFM exhaust I gotta worry about, I've also gotta provide that much more outside air or get ventilation air in that's cooled, heated, dehumidified, and all that stuff. So to go to an acute care room in a standard hotel room is gonna be a bit tough. Um, I think that, you know, if I understood correctly that, that there's a chance that they're looking at even a Javits Center, maybe going to an acute care uh, facility there, I think a large arena, big ballroom in a hotel would work perfect for that. The other thing I would add is that the, um, anytime you're dealing with the acute care patients, you have to have emergency power available and the air conditioning systems and all that stuff's going to have to be on emergency power in a big full service uh, type hotel, you're going to have a significant amount of emergency power available. There may be some rewiring that would have to be done, but that's not a big deal. Whereas in more like a standard three-story, in our, in our case, like a courtyard hotel, typically you're not going to have emergency power available there. So then that limits you being able to take care of patients that are on any type of life support equipment. Jenny, can I get you to talk just a little bit about uh, where negative pressure is uh, recommended and where it's not in terms of patient type? Sure. Um, so uh, negative pressure is really required for those um, patients that are, um, whose disease is aerosolized and is usually uh, contracted, like usually within three feet, um, you're concerned about it. When the CDC um, came out with the guidelines a couple of weeks ago, or even previously, and even the World Health Organization, the type of isolation that was recommended for COVID was droplet isolation, meaning that, that, that uh, the contact with that patient, the, the disease was not aerosolized um, within um, that required negative pressure. So droplet isolation requires full protective uh, equipment in terms of gown, mask, gloves, and a face mask. If you're going to be doing if, uh, a mechanical, an intubation or a bronchoscopy or some type of procedure, the CDC said then negative pressure would be required and that's when the virus could be aerosolized and so anybody doing that type of procedure would definitely be at risk of contracting coronavirus. So for purposes of our study and what we based it on was the droplet isolation, which does not require negative pressure. So does that answer your question, Stan? Yeah, yeah, it does. So, so back to what Terry was talking about, and I, I know you're not healthcare, but you used the word um, um, acute care in a guest room. Uh, that's not necessarily, doesn't necessarily mean intensive care. Uh, so we could care for a hospitalized patient in a hotel guest room that has positive pressure in the room and do that safely. In fact, most, uh, most hospital rooms are positive pressure rooms. Uh, we've got another question from, from Derek, and forgive me, uh, Derek, if I mispronounce your last name, but uh, Basagal, uh, he asks, what is the square footage requirement on average per patient bed in a ballroom setting and what are the aisle widths? Uh, we've got a couple of different versions of this based on patient acuity, but the square footage per patient bed uh, ranges from about 105 uh, square feet per bed to 180, if again, this is in that step down area. And then the beds are six feet apart, which is a CDC requirement. Uh, the aisles are slightly wider.
I'm going through the questions that uh, folks have asked here. So, uh, let me ask this to uh, to the to the core, um, kind of on behalf of the hotel operators. But you know, based on our conversations with uh, folks in the hospitality industry, they are poised and ready to act in this regard. Uh, and as, uh, as George has shared with us, of the 17 projects that have been uh, initiated at this point in time, if I got the numbers right, only one or two of those are in hotels. Uh, is, there, is there anything that the hotel operators can do, either as a group or individually, if they're really very interested in uh, opening up their facility to this kind of care. Is there anything that they can do? So question to George. The Yeah, I, I, here's what I said, the requirements are being generated from the uh, state local authorities and, uh, and they're, we're watching the peak and we're watching the, the beds. And I think that's their utmost concern. So to reach out directly to the local, local county, the sky state, healthcare professionals, state government, and make uh, your opportunities known, because what we what we are seeing is that the hotels could be a uh, COVID uh, convalescent type care, uh, easily adaptable where you don't get into the mechanical system, as right. we talked about as a stopper. As you mentioned, hotels are ideally suited for uh, the services and support that's provided, similar to almost a hospital setting where you have food service already there, laundry service, uh, circulation. Uh, so there's a lot. It's a lot of ideas for conversion. The other thing is um, thinking out loud when you were mentioning your brief that each, some of these large hotels have convention centers. You know, like for example, right. you see a lot of yeah, convention and, and that's what the state governments are asking us to provide. You can walk around and say, you know, some of these uh, hotels have convention centers that are large as the state, state or city owned. And that might be an opportunity to offer that because it does have the ancillary services already provided. Over. If anybody else in the core team wants to add anything, go, go right ahead. I, I would just add, um, you know, you look at our awards right now, and out of the 17, I think it's three or four that are hotels. But as far as the assessments have gone, George mentioned earlier, um, up over 800 assessments have been completed. And it's about 50-50 between hotels and arenas. But the, at the state level, they're making the decision uh, to, to go the arena route. Um, we're in the process of collecting some lessons learned and at the, in the grand scheme of things, we've been at this mission for, um, you know, I think 11 days since our first award um, to get feedback, but there's a question in the chat window about equipment um, and, and who the medical providers are going to be. And that's all coordinated at the, the state and local level. And so my sense um, is that it is easier uh, flash to bang to start treating patients in the arena uh, because there's minimal modification uh, and they can roll in equipment as quickly as possible. Right. Uh, so we'll, we'll get some, some objective feedback on that in the next couple of weeks. Uh, so John, sort of the John, John Hogan, can you, uh, can you share some of your experience um, in with us? Experience. Can you be a little bit more specific in that? in terms of uh, what you've been either doing or trying to do in this process and uh... what well, I know that we have a couple of hotels that have been uh, at least one that's been taken over by the core uh, or the core has come in in New Orleans and and uh, is using that for for either healthcare workers or for um, for patient use um, I guess one of the questions I would have is what, what hotels has the core identified or FEMA identified that we could help facilitate community line of communication with the owners to make it happen? You're talking about this, George Lee, are you talking about the, the list of hotels where we've been asked to provide an assessment for and, and given that information back to the state? Well, well I, I guess, you know, our, our organization has a tremendous network of hotel owners and a, a lot of those hotels right now are either closed or, or empty. And some of those owners might be very, very interested in stepping up and using those buildings for, to address the greater need of either healthcare workers or for patient use. How, 
how could we put our ownership community in touch with the core or or FEMA to, to facilitate that happening? I'll, I'll throw that idea out to the team. If you got any ideas? But George, one of the things that I heard you one of the things that I heard you say earlier, and I don't know if this this is the answer or just part of the answer, is to make the connection with the state office of emergency preparedness. Yeah, because that, that's where the decisions are being made. Because like 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 Kenny just said, there's four eight hundred assessments, four hundred on have been hotels, and only three have been uh, have bites on. Where we've been asked to uh, give a mission assignment from FEMA to say go do it. The reason we don't get more of them is because the state hasn't requested it to FEMA. So there's, you know, there's I, 396 opportunities still out there. I, I guess if I looked at, at you know the great presentation that uh, HKS shared with us at the beginning, having having the uh, severely you know I, I guess it was like ICU beds in the ballroom, uh, and then other you know other convalescing patients. Convalescing patients. Sorry, I'm getting some echo. Convalescing patients in the guest rooms and maybe medical workers in other guest rooms. Is that something that is appealing to the core? I don't believe that's our decision. It would be a local health official's decision as to what is appealing as to what type of patient in what area of the hotel. That's a, that's a, a little bit of a nice segue there. We've got... Uh, uh, Wingy with us from uh, Texas Health Resources, who is a large provider, a healthcare provider here in North Dallas, uh, North Texas. Uh, Wingy, as a provider, could you maybe uh, talk about what your preference would be as it relates to a, a convention center, full service hotel, an arena, and then also address, if you can, what you as a provider would or could do or can't do to mobilize a movement of patients into that setting within 10 days or two weeks. Don't mean to put you on the spot there, but. Um. No, happy to uh, contribute. And the reason I'm not on video is an incident command. There's a lot going on back and forth and I didn't want to distract um, on the screen. Um, so uh, I would say as we're looking at this, you know, I've seen the questions about could we become a patient room in 10 days. Um, I don't think that's realistic for ICU, both from a medical gas and from a power um, requirement situation when you think about the amount of equipment that these individuals are on. So I don't think that it critical care is realistic in either a ballroom or a patient room setting, or sorry, a hotel room setting, unless that hotel room is so loaded with tech and can handle the power requirements of some of these large pieces of equipment um, to take care of these patients. On the general care side, I think it is possible, although a lot of the general acute patients who are COVID positive are also requiring. Okay, so Lindsay, Lindsay, I think you're losing the battle for bandwidth in the command center right there. Support, which also requires medical gases. Um, as we've looked at how to use spaces um, like uh, hotels or all, you know spaces that have not been medical spaces, uh, is really in the post acute. We lost you. Brian, we may just need to come back to Wingy. Yeah, yeah. Or, or Wingy, if you could answer in the in the chat function. Brian, we may want to just mute Wingy for now. Yeah. <laughs> Poor Wingy. Technology at its best. Uh, it sounds painful. Really the there, I think Brian got her muted. 
Now, Wenji did also address another question on the chat process, and that is, how does a how does a hotel link with the healthcare organization to provide lodging for staff who can't go home, et cetera? And um, hospice and and or home health. Yeah. Uh, and and what she answered is that she is aware of uh, hotel facilities that have negotiated um, very much reduced rates directly with the healthcare organizations to provide those uh, staffing opportunities for um, for their patients. I mean, for their staff. All right, we um, Jason, we're running kind of. Close to the end, let me ask just a couple of more questions. Uh, one of the things that's been on our mind as we consider this is, uh, and this is to the to the hotel operators that are on the panel. What what sort of renovation do you think would be required to um, destigmatize a hotel that has been used to care for? COVID-19 patients or staff who've been exposed to COVID-19 patients so that when this is all over, you could get up and running again. John, I don't know if you want to address that or somebody else on the panel can. You know, I'll, 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 throw, um, I'll throw my own two cents in as my own opinion. I, I want to believe that after, after we get through with using one, one, any one of the building types mentioned, that it will be cleaned and, and thoroughly, thoroughly cleaned, that it's safe for everybody to go into. And I wanna believe that the American public or the, or, the, or the citizens of the world will feel comfortable going into those spaces knowing we have you know, people like HKS and other professionals like you out there working on this. Terry, Terry Smith, if you wanna jump in here and give me your opinion. I will say though that in some of my experience in working in disasters in the past, um, the public has very quickly come back to our hotels um, with no issue of concern without getting into any specifics. Sorry. Yeah, I think this, this is Terry Smith, just real, and I'll throw this in real quick. I think on the HVAC side of stuff, the mechanical ventilation exhaust systems, that stuff can be cleaned up and whatnot with pressure washing and all kinds of antibacterial stuff. But on the FF and E side, one of the things we looked at in, uh, in, in, our, in our analysis was uh, it's fair to assume a lot of existing FF&E in the hotel is probably going to get pretty trashed out or pretty destroyed during this process. And so if you go in there and strip it all out and put it in a warehouse and just bring hospital type FF&E in, probably not reasonable given the con time constraints. But we kind of in our, in our exercise looked at should we just go ahead and put that hotel into a normal uh, renovation cycle and just replace all the FF&E uh, and, and do a complete refurb of all the painting and finishes inside the hotel. It doesn't take that awfully long to do those kind of things, but it will also thought that if you did that 100%, then you could go out and people would feel comfortable thinking it's not a, quote, X virus hotel type thing. You it, know? Would be, it would be almost as a grand reopening of the property. Right. Agreed. So, so George, uh, George Lee, is, is, is there federal money to help that renovation at the back end of the process? Um, I'm, I'm not able to, to answer that question right now. I would think that uh, if a hotel was entering a lease agreement or for use of their facility, that the restoration should be uh, part of the uh, discussion. Okay. So that's just subject to negotiations during the process. I, I would, if I was a hotel owner, I would like to uh, uh, have that discussion up front as part of the lease agreement. And I believe in the one case where we are using our hotel, I think that discussion was had, and I think they are talking about putting it. I'm not part of the conversation, but I, from what I understand, they're talking about putting it back in the condition it was in prior to the temporary use. Okay. Okay. Um, scrolling through the questions here. Uh, one of the things that we've looked at in all of these conversions is uh, availability of materials. Uh, George uh, and team, are you having any problems getting the equipment or the construction materials that you need to do these conversions that you've been involved in so far? 
Yeah, this, this is George. We ha we have not experienced, uh, you know, there's supply chain issues, that, whether on the medical side or the construction side, that we are concerned with. We're watching the markets. We have not experienced it as yet, but we are concerned, particularly if we started getting into modifying hotel rooms or, or uh, facilities for mechanical ventilation. For example, heat filters, heat units, exhaust fan type things. We might run into some supply chain issues, but up, to, up till now, no. Uh, Hank, have you seen anything from your perspective on the Hump Sewing Engineering Center? Yeah, the, the one that has surfaced in, over the last few days is, is HEPA filters, um, trying to figure out the best way to keep the supply of HEPA filters moving. Uh, I don't have any details on where that's at right now. Okay. Well, we are running soon yeah. on time here. So, Jason, I want to kick it to you to let you wrap this up so we can uh, get everybody out uh, within the hour. Uh, I will say that everyone whose email address we have, we will send you this information and we are certainly committed to however possible keeping this conversation going. But uh, Jason, you have uh, anything that you'd like to say to try to wrap this up? Yeah, I just would like to thank everybody for attending, in particular our panelists. Uh, thanks to the Army Corps of Engineers for joining the conversation and helping us connect dots with the hospitality industry, some of our providers, some of our local communities. I think these conversations are very helpful in terms of just understanding the process and the potential opportunities for us to all come together to support each other, you know, in this time of need. And we're just happy that we've been able to be kind of the conduit for the conversation. And as Stan mentioned, you know, we're happy to send out any information's free share for us. I believe this conversation was also recorded and I think we can make it available um, beyond today. And um, we came together quick. Uh, we really appreciate the availability. We know that most of you are busy and you guys, the Army Corps, we wanna thank you personally for all the service you're doing right now for uh, our communities. And thanks for taking the time out to join us and uh, our hospitality uh, partners. Thanks for joining the conversation. You know, as, as we learn more, we're gonna continue to share and uh, Thanks for just an overall uh, good discussion, and we hope we can keep it going. We're also looking at some other uh, alternatives in terms of school conversion and, of course, uh, some specifics more on the larger assembly conversion, too. So if you're looking for information on that, we're happy to share some thinking. So uh, thanks, everybody, for coming. We really appreciate it. Hopefully it was time well spent. Thank you very much from the Corps of Engineers for inviting us to be a member of your panel. Thank you. Thanks, George. Appreciate it. Thanks, Kenny, too. Appreciate it. Hank, thanks for coming on. Thank you, everybody. Hey, bud. Thanks for inviting everybody. Yeah, John, Terry, thanks a lot for joining in. Appreciate it. You're yeah, very welcome. Pleasure. Thank you all for hosting. All right.